Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPad and iPhone, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. Hi, I'm Chuck Joyner, and this is Mac Voices at Showstoppers at WWDC in San Francisco. I get the chance this time to talk to an old friend, Mark Hollis of Mac Practice. We haven't seen each other since, I think, one or two Mac Worlds ago, Mark. Well, the last Mac World. It was that a couple of years ago, I guess, right? And, and I hate the idea that the last Mac World, that's, but, you know, that's another matter. But I'm so glad to see you here with some updates on what's going on in the medical field and the Macintosh and Mac Practice. Great. Well, you know, Chuck, we've been doing the same thing that we've done for the last 10 years, and actually the same thing we've been doing for 30 years on the Mac platform, which is developing software for doctors who prefer to use Macs in their practices. That's physicians, dentists, chiropractors, and eye care professionals. And in order for certain doctors, most doctors in the United States, to be able to use a Mac in their practice, they have to use software that is certified, government certified. We've talked about that a couple of times. I think we talked about it maybe in 2011 when the first certification came out. As I recall, there was a little frustration going on at that point. Well, the frustration got heightened in 2014 with a new certification standard, which was a much, much more intense standard, another 800 page of, of certification standards which we spent about two years developing, and which a number of vendors, not on the Mac side, but a number of vendors across the entire uh, universe of electronic health records vendors have gotten certified. Many companies have still not gotten the 2014 certification. But my practice, MD, DC, DDS, and 2020 are all ONC, ACB 2014 edition certified, which means that a doctor that bills Medicare does not receive the penalty that other doctors will receive that are not using a certified software. Uh, it also means that a doctor that accepts Medicaid can still receive as much as $64,000 of federal funding. The government has actually given out about $23 billion now, Chuck, which is about $4 billion more than they plan to give out starting in 2011, and they're still not done. There's still a few years. They're still giving our money away. <laughs> I, I don't want to take us off on the side, but I've got to ask, why are they why are they doing that? Why are they funding this part of the medical industry? Well, there there are a couple of things that they're trying to accomplish. The major thing that they're trying to accomplish is interoperability. And interoperability means that when you're when you see a doctor and you have your clinical information and your demographic information recorded in that doctor's practice, that they can share that with other doctors. There's only one problem with that, Chuck. The problem is that in order to share it, it would be kind of important for them to know who you are and be able to identify you in both practices, right? Wouldn't you think? That'd be kind of like the yeah, yeah that, that would seem to be a good idea. <laughs> so the government didn't put that as a foundation. So we're sort of retrofitting that. And my practice is one of the top electronic health records vendors that are a member of an organization called Commonwealth Alliance. And what we've done, uh, this group, Commonwealth Alliance, is actually come up with a patient identification system that is working for about a million patients in the United States. And our intention is to be able to make that available to all patients in the United States and all providers so that when you uh, need for a doctor to be able to have your information, to know what your allergies are, when you have a car accident, let's say in Florida, and you're from uh, Michigan. I don't know where you're from, Chuck. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. So when you're from Pennsylvania, but you're visiting Florida, and you have an accident, and you may not be able to tell the doctor what your allergy is, and the doctor doesn't know what to give you, it would be important, kind of important to know that this is Chuck Joyner, the same Chuck Joyner who's seen his primary care doctor in Pennsylvania. And so that's the whole intention of being able to do that. And that's what they're look, working toward. Uh, that's supposed to be stage three. Right now we're in stage two in 2014. And in stage in 2017 and 2018 we'll be in stage three. But my practice is also one of the top vendors in the United States that actually meet with the Office of the National Coordinator and CMS at the, at the largest healthcare meeting in the United States called HIMSS. Uh, and we're part of the trade organization, the Electronic Health Records Association. And we advise, we contribute, we meet with, we commiserate with, <laughs> and we listen to, 
uh, and we and we work together to try to achieve this interoperability for uh, for healthcare in the United States. So, so I got to ask. That's an interesting way to end up in end that that paragraph. Trying to achieve it. Why is it why is it so difficult to achieve? Is it a matter of so many vendors trying to squeeze their way in? Is it too many competing interests between the, the, the practitioners and the patients and the, the medical establishment? Why is it such a challenge? Well, I gave you one real reason. The re one reason is being able to match up data from one provider to another provider. The other thing is healthcare is not simple. There's over 110 different specialties in medicine. And what the healthcare system is trying to do, it's trying to treat, treat every specialist as if they're the same, as if they're a primary care doctor, as if they're your gatekeeper. So when you go to your family physician, or um, in some cases, for example, if it's your wife, might go to uh, her OBGYN, might be a primary care doctor. That might be somebody who's a gatekeeper. So when you go to that doctor, that doctor has a different level of responsibility because they're managing all of the information from all of the specialists. So when you break your toe, you don't expect to have a blood test. You don't expect to do your height and weight. You don't expect to gather this other information. But it's being treated as if everybody's a, everybody's a primary care doctor. So in addition to that, the orthopedic surgeon that you would go to is going to collect different information than your primary care doctor does not. So it's hard to mesh all this information when it's different information. It's not the same information in each of these situations. So this is why, whether I go to an orthopedic, whether I go to a neurologist or whatever, that they are still taking my blood, blood pressure, taking my height, taking my weight, and all those things, because they have to by law? That's correct. In order to be able to receive the money and avoid Medicare penalties, they have to meet that standard. Now, there, there has been a change in a 250-page document that came out just a few weeks ago there's a contemplated change. And of course, it's the federal government. So this change affects 2015. I don't know if you noticed, but we're six months into 2015. Doctors are already demonstrating meaningful use, but we expect in August that the, the proposed rule will become the final rule. They'll only have to do it for 90 days. And some of what they have to report will be what they considered, um, I think it's called over the top, if I recall correctly. It's 250 pages, I don't remember everything about it. <laughs> But basically, it's over the top, and so the government is saying, you know, we're, you're collecting this information. You don't have to do it everywhere. We want to eliminate redundancy. So they're trying to address that, which we're very, our vendors are very grateful for, and we know our clients will be very grateful for. But that's the reason that they were doing it, because they're requiring the same thing from every provider. That's why if you went to a dentist who was trying to collect this information and get money from the federal government, they would be taking your height and weight and blood pressure. <laughs> And worse yet, they'd be asking you what it is. You'd be reporting it yourself, and obviously it's unlikely that it would be accurate. Accu I would say inaccurate information is worse than no information. I, I would agree. But that, that will get them around the penalty? If, if they collect it from me instead of objectively well, measuring it? The rules are written in such a way that it can be self-reported. Wow. Which basically corrupts all of the data. I, I doubt very many of us that are slightly overweight report our way to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, Mark, it strikes me, the last couple of conversations we've had about these issues, I think the very first time we, we talked about MAC practice, it was more about how easy it was for the practitioner, how you were taking things, putting them on the MAC, they were able to log into the systems at home, and then we got iOS, and we had iPads and iPhones into the mix. Right. And it seems like now what we're talking about primarily is the bureaucracy and how MAC practice is fighting back trying to have it make sense and make it easier for the practitioner. Right. Well, we're definitely, all electronic health record vendors and doctors are in the same situation where we are meeting the government standards. But the good news, Chuck, is that we've met the government standards. All of our products are certified. They were certified last year. Uh, we put an incredible amount of effort. We developed our software in a way that nobody would develop their software. In addition to that, we went through during that period of time when we were developing to the certification, we went through two new operating systems from Apple, if I only count OS X. But if I count iOS, that's four operating systems. We have had to update our program for the operating systems. Our PC brethren didn't have to do that because nothing changed on the PC side. But on the Mac side, we've had to do that and also develop 
in order to meet the standard. The good news is that we're past that time and we're developing new things. Would you like to hear about some of the new things? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Please tell me it's gonna be easier for the patients. And our, well, that's great, that's a great segue. You didn't even know to say that, Chuck, that's great. So yes, the new things that we're doing have to do with the patient being able to interact with the doctor and being able to do it in a secure way that's HIPAA compliant for the doctor uh, and in a way that also gives the patient more access to their information and a greater ability to communicate securely. So there's a patient portal. I don't know if you've been to a doctor recently, but probably most of the people listening to the video have been to a doctor and been invited to log on to their patient portal. So we have a patient portal in my practice. We've had it for a couple of years because it was a requirement, but it was not a requirement just that they have it available, but not that they actually use it. In 2014, it became required to actually use it. And so patients are using it to be able to access their patient data, to be able to ask the doctor, notice maybe there's uh, your address has changed or your phone number has changed or your clinical information, you're, you have a question about it. You're able to communicate securely using a technology called Direct, Project Direct. And we use secure messaging. Now, why is it important to do secure messaging? Because email's not secure and your doctor is obligated and you want it to be obligated to secure your information, not exchange it in such a way that um, that a hacker from China or a hacker from Russia or a hacker from ISIS is going to actually try to get your clinical information, which is worth a lot of money, 50 to $100 per person in terms of getting data. So it's very important that everything is secure because our product itself is certified. That's built into the certification, the security of the data at rest when it's actually in a doctor's office using that practice, but also exchanging data. But in addition to that, we've come up with other things that we've had clients that ask us to do for their patients. So some patients, some doctors would like their patients to be able to actually schedule their own appointment online. And so we're offering that. That's, that'll be available either late this month in June or it'll be available in early July. Doctors are saying, we have the iPad application, I don't know if you remember, Clipboard, so that they can fill out all the information online in Clipboard and then send it right in, sign their forms, take your own photo, and then the staff does not have to enter that information. So we also are offering that online. So in, before you come in the office, you could fill in your information and then send it, and it goes right into the system so that the staff does not have to enter. Now, not every system does the staff saving of time. So you might just be filling in a PDF, but somebody's still reading it and typing it in. In our case, it's going in as discrete data. Um, we're also allowing you to be able to securely communicate with the doctor. And we're about ready to allow the doctor to be able to send you an attachment. Uh, could be an x-ray, it could be, uh, could be their clinical notes. Send you something that, uh, that you might want to have as an attachment based within the system. Then as a part of the data, I know I'm telling you a lot. <laughs> okay, keep going, it's, it's, it's interesting. So you're also required and you're able to be able to forward your information to another provider securely. So you can actually get your information that you have with this provider and send it yourself to another provider. So you can review it, you can download it, and you can send it. Okay, so this is something new. I have, ex have not experienced this. I've experienced the patient portal thing, and we'll get back to that in a second. But this, this, is, this is wonderful because this means that I, could, I would not have to go to a new doctor or a new specialist and go through that god-awful process of, of writing out my entire medical history. I can just send it directly to them. You can send it to them, and if they have a certified product, they can bring the information in. Now, there could be still additional information that they might send, but this does facilitate the, this is the beginning of interoperability. This is the foundation of interoperability, is having systems that meet the same standard, and what we've done is make it possible, we're the, we are the provider on the Mac platform, the only provider on the Mac platform that has native OS X and iOS applications that make it possible for doctors who prefer to use a Mac. Most of them are using Macs at home and they would prefer to use a Mac in the office because they know they're, not, they're gonna have a fraction of the support costs that they're currently paying for a PC system. And, but they have to be able to have a system that's certified. They have to be able to have a system that interoperates. They have to be able to have a system where they can avoid the Medicare penalties. And that's for, that's for medical. Going back to Project Direct, yes. are, are all patient portals the same? And what I mean by that is, are they all, is it a standardized thing or is, is one, and I'm, and I'm not asking you to call products, right. but 
do I need to, I mean, should this be something I'm talking to my doctor about, just what he's doing with it and, and how up to date he is? So there is a foundation of a patient portal, what the government calls a patient portal, and it has to have certain features in it, like it has to have secure messaging. It has to have the ability to be able to download, to transmit, uh, and, to, um, and to view your clinical information. Uh, it has to have the ability for you to be able to view your demographic information. So there are certain things that have to be in the basic, but then the other things may or may not be there. It does not have to have, provide the patient the ability to register online and put their information in, their uh, demographic and their uh, clinical information, and have it go right into their electronic health record as discrete data. It does not have to have the ability to have online scheduling. So these are things that we're that we've added for our clients over and above that. Um, and so we have, so there's a basic, there's a basic to it if it's certified. Part of me, I, I'm playing into the Mac practice product, but part of me says that I almost would like to seek out a doctor who's using Mac practice because they're going to be maybe paying a little more attention to the patient experience in, in, in a world that seems to be increasingly challenging to the patient experience. Right. Well, I, I, there's a difference in personality between somebody that uses a Mac and somebody that uses a PC. I think you, we all you, know that. You, you are watching this knows it. You said it. I didn't. <laughs> well, I think we know that. I mean, we know that. And and people that I know that have been in my business, in the lab business, for example, that have worked in Macs and works with PCs, they work with my customers and they know that's somebody that you know has a different mindset. And so I think if you're looking for somebody with that mindset, yes, a Mac practice user uh, would be a great person. Or you could go to your PC user and say, "Why aren't you using my practice?" Because the guy probably he's probably using, you know, the uh, or the or the lady they're using a Mac at home, or they're using an iPhone, or they're using an iPad, and they just don't know that they could use it in their office. And so, so we'd be happy to sell them Mac practice <laughs> and make them one of our clients. Is they might have the right personality, but just not know that that's an option. Well, we'll change their personality. <laughs> Um, do, do you have a... It's easier to change their software. Yeah. <laughs> probably so, probably so. Serious question, though. Do you have a directory of physicians who are using Mac practice? Can I... Is there a place where I can go to find a physician? I mean, I'm not sure that's the best reason or the way you should use... Right. You should select a physician. But on the other hand, I can think of worse ways. Well, if you called our company and you wanted to know a physician that was in your area and especially that you're looking for, we certainly would be happy to give you that information. And that doesn't, I'm, again, I'm ser a serious question, that doesn't violate any privacy laws or anything with, with the doctors? No, no, because we're not giving patient information, we're just giving them, this is a doctor who uses my practice, which we'd be happy to do. We have basically providers in every specialty in medicine. We have, I don't know if you know, we, have thir we support 30,000 users of our software in 30 countries today. Wow. We have about 135 employees in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we've been doing it for 30 years, really. This company, my practice, is in its 11th year. At the, actually, we're just beginning our 12th year. Um, but, we've, but we've actually been in the business working on the platform, on the Apple platform, and using Apple technology for 30 years. In, in 30 countries, so, and we're just talking the U.S., so you... We're you, primarily in the U.S., we're primarily in the U.S., but... Yeah, but you still have other, other countries and other legalities you have to address. That's right, that's right. But we focus primarily on the U.S. because that's complex enough. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, by all means, please. Okay, so we have great charting for dental. Uh, charting is completely different, you know, than you don't use, char obviously, dental charting in any medical office. But we've taken our charting to the next level, what we think is a new generation. We're in an industry that's mature, and there are big products, big companies that have done charting, but their charting looks the same as it has for 20 years. And so we've taken to another generation. We actually, Patrick, I don't know if you've ever met Patrick, but he's my business partner, and he developed the first software that worked on a Macintosh for a dental practice, as well as medical and chiropractic. And he had he developed the first integrated charting software that worked with a practice management software on any platform. The first graphical user dental software. The first medical dental, the first healthcare software that used QuickTime when Apple, after Apple introduced QuickTime. So we got a long history of 30 years of developing using Apple technology and making it, making it useful and pertinent to uh, healthcare providers in the United States. So we have, we have great charting. Uh, we have also, you know, 
we haven't talked for a couple of years, we brought more and more uh, digital radiography and, and intraoral camera manufacturers onto the Mac platform because of the number of Mac users that we have who are dentists so that they could actually do everything natively on a Mac, which is what Mac users want to do. They don't want to, we have bridges to PC products when it's necessary, but they want to be native on a Mac. And we want to be native on a Mac. You know, to wrap this up, I, I'm sitting here thinking about the imaging. I'm thinking about, again, some of our first conversations way back when, when we were addressing issues of bandwidth and how important it was for physicians to be able to receive data on their iPhones at home after hours. And now it just has been taken to an incredibly new level, both for, for the practitioner as well as the complexity of the regulatory environment. Well, one of the other things that's happening in medicine and dentistry is that there are more multi-site locations. So we have great connections. We've worked on performance of the application to optimize it. Our product is client server, but we're working on a web client and we'll be working on a cloud solution. We don't think cloud is better because honestly, to me, cloud is more vulnerable. Because now your data is not in your office. Your patient's data is now somewhere else. And you've got a vendor, you've got a hosting company, you've got, they say that it's secure, but you don't have any control over it. Um, you have updates, uh, except, you know, they'll say, well, we updated here. Okay, well, they updated here, but you don't have control over what day and what time and when you're down. And then you have your ISP. And you don't know whether you're going to be completely out of business today because the ISP is not providing you an internet connection. And then you actually have to pay twice because you should have a backup ISP in case that ISP goes down on any particular day. So what are you going to say to the patient? Just go home? So you can't look at the schedule. You've got everything here. You're basically out of business on that day if you don't have access to information. So we're doing that because we know there's a call for that. But 94% of healthcare of doctors use client server. However, because venture capitalists have entered this market, and about 78% of the money they put in the market is for marketing and advertising, you would, and they're behind cloud vendors, you would be led to believe from their advertising that it's the reverse. But as a matter of fact, they're trying to break into the market. So the majority is still client server. And I think, honestly, I think security is becoming, every day you pick up the paper, and it's, is it Anthem Healthcare? Is it, you know, is it another big insurance company? Is it Target? Is it uh, Amazon? Is it somebody, uh, hackers, the Chinese hackers that, you know, are getting into iCloud or whatever it is, it's always related to the cloud and the vulnerability. And the question of whether you or I as a patient or whether our doctor really wants to have their data up in the cloud. Follow the money. Yes. <laughs> Mark, they're rolling up the, the room here. I think we better get out. It's so great to see you, and thank you for the update. We've got to do this more often, whether it's here at WWDC or wherever. That'd be great. Can I just invite, I'd like to invite those that are, that are viewing to please come to our website, website, or if some of you I know are consultants and you know Mac people, all of you go to a doctor, you go to a dentist, you go to a chiropractor. If they're not using a Mac, they could be using a Mac in their office. Hopefully, you're helping them use a Mac at home and uh, probably not giving them a lot of support, but maybe you're giving them some support. And uh, we would love to have you refer. We have an ambassador program for consultants. Uh, we would love to work together with you to help uh, your doctor become a MacPractice user uh, and help you solidify that relationship. Please visit MacPractice.com, register, take a look at our videos and get to know our products. Sounds good. Mark, it's good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Folks, we'll have more from uh, WWDC and Showstoppers here in San Francisco. Back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.